Welcome to the debut of Where Did the Road Go? Here on WVBR FM Ithaca. And tonight, to start things off right, we have a, uh, an author, researcher from California, who is actually a Cornell grad, ironically enough, who has written a book on uh, the world as a potential virtual reality. His name is Jim Elvich. And uh, for the next hour, we're going to be talking to him and uh, all about his theory and uh, different things in science that point for and against it and uh, what reality might be overall. So I'm your host, Soraya. If you want to uh, ask Jim any questions, go to our chat room at uh, www.wheredidtheroadgo.com and uh, you'll be able to talk, talk to us in there and uh, we'll pass along any good questions that anyone asks. You can also email your questions to contact at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Are you with us, Jim? I am indeed. Thank you very much, sir. It's uh, really great to be on your show, your inaugural show, and uh, I appreciate it. It's kind of exciting for me because I used to listen to WVBR now and then way back in the day when I was uh, at Cornell University. And what did you go to Cornell for? I studied electrical engineering there. I was, I'm an old-timer, so I was there from 76 to 81. I um, got a, a bachelor's in 1980 and then stayed on for a master's degree in 1981. So uh, I know Ithaca very well and Cornell very well and uh, uh, some of the radio stations in, uh, in that town. So very cool. Nice. And you actually have a pretty uh, lengthy biography as well, don't you, as far as things you've done? Yeah, I suppose anybody can put a lengthy biography together, if they <laughs> get, you know, into too much detail. But yeah, I've, I've kind of played around with some different things. I've, you know, done the kind of traditional uh, high tech, um, you know, move up the management path. But I've also done some consulting. I've done started some companies and written a book in, in an area that's completely different than what I do for a day job. So. Uh, I like to keep life interesting and pursue different things and always kind of pursuing knowledge, I guess. All right. And the, the book is called what? Uh, the book is called The Universe Solved. And what what does that mean exactly? Well, it's to be honest, it's a little bit of a you know catchy title. I certainly don't have the solution to the universe. Um, however, I would say that the, the content of the book is kind of thought-provoking, um, and, and it was probably more so in 2008 when it was published than it is today. Uh, honestly, there are an awful lot of scientists and journalists and futurists and different people who are talking about the same topics these days, and, and so it's, uh, it's becoming a little bit more mainstream, but, you know, the overall idea of the book was to pre present different categories of evidence that we could be living in a virtual reality you know, maybe a la The Matrix or something like that. Um, and I, I should say ahead of time that I don't necessarily believe that. Um, I'm, you know, I do have sort of an engineering and scientific training, so um, not that that, you know, predisposes me to believe any one thing or another, but more that because of that training, I have a tendency to think of things not in black and white terms, I, I think of things in terms of evidence. You know, I don't believe anything is particularly right or factual or truthful or anything like that. I tend to think in terms of, well, there's a lot of evidence for this, and there's not so much evidence for this, so, you know, I'm kind of leaning in this direction versus that direction. So, um, you know, why I, you know, certainly can't say that I'm convinced that this is the case, there really is some very interesting and compelling evidence that, um, you know, that lends a good a good argument to the idea that our world is discrete, it's digital, it's bits, and that it may actually be under program control. <laughs> and and you say bits like the world is data as opposed to non-data, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, you know, if you think about it, the way we, m most people think of their reality and think of the world and the universe is that it's continuous, which means that, it, it, you know, between any two points that you can think of in space, there are, there are other points. And no matter how 
how much you turn up the power of a microscope or, you know, look into the fabric of reality and look into particles and things like that. that you, you know, that we think there's always um, some, some structure to it and, and something in between any two points. Um, but if that's the case, then, you know, effectively there's sort of infinite resolution to everything. And infinity is a pretty tough concept to grasp. You know, the, the whole idea that you know, it's not just a huge number, it's a number that doesn't end. So the idea of a continuous world means there has to be effectively continuous data to represent it. Um, however, there's, there's been an awful lot of research that shows that our world might not be continuous, it might be discrete, which means that you dive deep enough into you know, the nature of particles and the nature of reality and the structure of space and things like that, that it's not a continuous structure. It's a discrete structure. It's, it's digital. And uh, if that's the case, then, you know, it's really just described by data. And if it's described by data, then who's to say that it isn't the, you know, substrate of some big computer program? You know, one, one example is, is matter. We used to think back in the, the days of ancient Greece, they used to think atoms were these little billiard ball type of uh, objects and that uh, you know that idea held for thousands of years until um, actually through the 1700s it was kind of resurrected so at that point people thought well you know solid matter is just these little billiard ball type things all jammed together until Ernest Rutherford and some other scientists found out that no it's not true most of atoms are empty space you got this little nucleus and, and all these electrons around it this sort of cloud and everything in between is just empty space in fact you know at that point they were saying you know one out of uh, you know trillion or one out of ten to the thirteenth uh, of space is, is, is the stuff and the rest is just empty space well you know forty years later they discover that even protons are mostly empty space they consist of quarks that uh, you know that, that also have empty space in between them and so now it's you know one out of ten to the thirtieth or something like that which is kind of like a grain of sand compared to the size of the earth you know is that's how much stuff there is versus how much empty space there is and then more recently string theorists have said that that even those little quarks and electrons and every single particle is composed of the little vibrating bits of string that are so thin that you know now the stuff is one out of 10 to the 52 parts empty space so you know they, they keep on they, space gets more and more tenuous and structure gets more and more tenuous every like 15 or 20 years and you can see where this is going where it's going is that there's really no stuff at all and it's really probably just data. And everything that we experience is the result of some rules on how that data interacts with data in our fingertips or data in our eyes or data in our brain or whatever. And even the right? stuff that we, we pick up with our senses isn't exactly what it seems to be. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we think, okay, well, we see something, therefore it has to exist. But what is sight? Sight is just our mind processing a lot of bits of data anyway. You know, it's just reflection of light off of something that's going into our eyes and, and it, you know, it's turned into effectively digital signals that uh, our brain is somehow processing and interpreting as, you know, a table or a car or whatever it is we think we're looking at. So, well, you know, there are a lot of good reasons to think that that objective reality out there really does exist because your friend sitting next to you says, hey, I see a yellow car there, and you see a yellow car, therefore there must be a yellow car there. But if you think about it, it could be something completely different. It could be the fact that the idea of a yellow car is injected into your consciousness, into your mind, um, and at the same time, it's injected it into your neighbor's mind. And so you both are experiencing the same thing at the same time under program control. There's no reason why that couldn't be the, you know, the root behind everything that we experience. And in fact, um, a lot of physicists have 
conducted some experiments that determined that at the level of, you know, at the very detailed level, reality doesn't even exist, That's a, which is a really kind of bizarre concept, but, um, you know, there's a, a group of physicists in Austria, it's called IQOPI, I-Q-O-Q-I, you know, people can Google that and, and read about their experiments that they've actually done on reality where they've determined that that reality doesn't exist until you observe it. So that's kind of an interesting idea, you know, that, and, and this is accurate to an order of, you know, 80 orders of magnitude, so it's like incredibly precise experiments. That's a pretty interesting concept, the idea that, you know, that reality doesn't exist unless there's a conscious observer there. And what, does that, what does that say? That, is, that, that says that, you know, the, the consciousness, our consciousness is a crucial part of reality, as opposed to an, an artifact of our brain, right? right? And that, that's, that, that's where quantum physics kind of disturbed so many physicists and stuff when that, that observational aspect came into it. Absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, it bothered Einstein until the day he died. Um, it's bothered a lot of scientists, and, and some of them have just agreed to accept that the world is uncertain, that there are things that we can't know, and we can't really determine, you know, to some ultimate level of granularity. We can't determine a position, or we can't determine matter, or something like that, and they're, they're fine with that. And that's one way of, of looking at things is kind of like throwing up your hands and saying, well, we don't have a, um, we don't have math and physics that makes sense of this, therefore, um, you know, we'll just accept that the world is very uncertain. Another way of looking at it is to say that that uncertainty is uh, due to the fact that, um, you know, that it, that it has to be invoked or, or generated by consciousness. So, you know, if you, if you kind of turn this whole theory up on its head and think about, you know, how would, how would somebody create a, a virtual reality in a computer? You know, there are all kinds of uh, tools and software packages and things like that that you can use to create, you know, beautiful landscapes and, and you know, virtual worlds and things. So, um, but, but they all they all have to be somewhat efficient because honestly, to try to simulate a virtual world down to every single subatomic particle would be incredibly computational intensive, as, as you can imagine. So, but do you need, need to do that? You don't really need to determine, you know, that pencil that's sitting in front of you down to every single um, nuclear particle that, that composes that, or that, that, that pencil uh, is made of. You don't have to do that. You just have to be able to define that that pencil enough so that you can observe it and know that it know what its shape is and its color and things like that. Until they until somebody cracks it open or breaks it, and now you have to look inside of it. And now the program would have to generate some structure inside. But until you look at it through a microscope, they don't even have to generate that much of structure. You see what I'm saying? So. You know, as, as you follow this line of argument deeper and deeper into the structure of the pencil, you realize that um, at some point you're going to get to the point where you're looking at um, atoms or you're looking at particles. And, and if you have a device, an electron microscope, or some sufficiently detailed device that can actually determine the position of things, well, at that point, the you know, the, the program would have to actually define where that position is, but it only have to define it because you're looking at it. You see what I mean? So the, the whole idea of, um, you know, of, of an observer-created reality is, is sort of a requirement of virtual reality. And our scientists are saying that, well, we, we seem to have that effect. We seem to have an observer-created reality not too many people are putting together, you know, the one concept with the other. So it's, it's an interesting area, and the reason they're not putting it together is because they're, frankly, a little bit afraid to. I mean, this is a, you know, a heretical idea, and heretical ideas in science take 30 years before they get accepted. Well, at least. Been, 
Sorry? At least 30 years. Yes, exactly. I mean, take um, a cold fusion. You know, yeah. these two electrochemists in, at the University of Utah come up with some experiments that show that there's some cold fusion effect, and they get laughed out of the scientific community, and people are, you know, calling them charlatans and calling it pseudoscience and writing books about it, and... You know, they have to take their, you know, their tails between their legs and leave the country and go practice electrochemistry in the south of France somewhere. And, you know, then what happens uh, 10, 15, 20 years later, um, you know, one experiment after another reproduces what those guys did. Then the, the Department of Energy starts, um, you know, investigating this, and they change the name. They don't call it cold fusion anymore. They call it... L-E-N-R, Low Energy Nuclear Reaction. <laughs> the same thing, but now the fact that we have a different name means that I can still get my, I can still have my tenure and do this research, or I can still get funding for my research. If I call it cold, cold fusion, I get laughed at, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then last year, in 2012, um, CERN, uh, that uh, you know, scientific research facility over there in Switzerland, announced that their results the original results had validity and it, it should be investigated further. And so it took 30 years before the scientific mainstream said, yep, you guys did something here um, interesting and it bears further study. Um, but it, it takes that long for people to be willing to think, to um, acknowledge certain new ideas because they upend your foundation of your, your research or your yeah, well, knowledge base or whatever it is you teach or well, it, it, books it, that you use. Yeah, it, it seems to affect, there, there seems to be a certain level of dogma on certain scientific disciplines that they don't like questioned. And it doesn't, apl it doesn't apply to all science and some science is, you know, some scientists themselves are open-minded, but a lot of times they pay for it. They do, and, you know, this is, uh, you know, it's an interesting area and it's one that kind of overlaps my professional world because we you know, we teach people in uh, in the software industry to um, you know to challenge the existing ideas and to, to challenge um, sort of company norms and ways of doing business and ways of developing software because that's the only way you're ever going to you're going to improve. Um, all, the, you can never. It really doesn't make sense to talk about best practices. If you use the word best practice, it kind of implies that you're giving up. You know, that, well, we have the best practice, that's what we're going to do from now on forever, and nothing is ever the best practice forever. You know, you, you always need to think of it in terms of, you know, trying to improve things and, and question things. So, um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting area in science, too. To, there, are, there are those who are open-minded enough to question reality and question the, the scientific norms that they currently, you know, are, are taught, um, but it's a rare person who, who's sort of an expert in their field who's willing to do that because that, again, you know, may impact their funding, their livelihood. Right, right. And I do have to say at this point, uh, the opinions on this show are not representative necessarily of WVBR or its management. They are of uh, ourselves and uh, our selective guests. And uh, not that I think you're necessarily saying anything controversial tonight. Um, we are talking to Jim Elvich, and this is the debut of Where Did the Road Go? And uh, you can go to our website at wheredidtheroadgo.com and talk to us in the chat room if you have any questions for Jim or any comments. You can also email them to contact at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Uh, let's, let's talk about consciousness for a minute. Sure. Um, now, obviously, in a virtual world, consciousness would exist outside of it, kind of like playing a video game and getting so absorbed into it that you forget what's going on around you. Yep, exactly. So is there evidence of this? I mean, what, what is the evidence that... Is there any real evidence that consciousness only exists inside the brain, that it's an artifact? Uh, actually, there isn't. There, there, there's only circumstantial evidence. And, you know, the important thing to, to realize about science is that science doesn't deal with facts and it doesn't deal with proofs and it doesn't deal with truth you know truth is philosophy and proofs are mathematics and facts are law i suppose uh, science deals with hypothesis 
hypotheses and evidence. And there is some evidence that some aspects of consciousness um, happen in the brain, but it, you know, technically it's circumstantial evidence. Um, you know, people think about certain things and certain regions of their brains light up under a, um, you know, under a brain scan. Right. But that doesn't mean that, you know, that the seed of consciousness is there. So, no, there's no proof. There's no, you know, I would say there's not even really strong evidence that consciousness is just an, an artifact of the complexity of the brain. In fact, I think there's more evidence to the contrary. If, you know, if you went by the complexity of the brain, for example, um, you'd, you know, the brain has um, about as many uh, connections as, as the Internet does. So the number of synapses in the human brain is like the number of links on the Internet. Um, so if complexity is what generates consciousness, you'd, you'd wonder, well, is the Internet conscious? And I don't think anybody you know, has any evidence of, of the internet kind of going off on its own and, and, and doing things. There's no Skynet yet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it, or, or you could look at um, the speed of the brain. The, you know, the brain is, has been estimated to be in the order of, um, you know, 0.1 to 20 petaflops, and, uh, which is, I think is uh, like a quadrillion uh, floating point operations per second, something like that. Uh, the fastest computer that exists out there um, is actually there, I think there was another one um, that, that topped uh, the Sequoia uh, last year. I'm not sure the name of it, but the Sequoia clocked in at around 16 petaflops. So it's actually faster than the human brain, and yet there's no evidence that you know the Sequoia has developed consciousness. There's it hasn't turned into the HAL 9000. It hasn't you know. <laughs> started to think on its own. Well, isn't there also a difference between conscious data rate and unconscious? Oh, there is. There is a, a huge difference. And, and that's, um, you know, great, great question. Uh, the, the conscious data rate, I've seen estimates ranging from uh, something like 16 bits per second up to maybe 2 kilobits per second. So the amount of data that you can consciously process. And that's a very, very low number, um, as, as opposed to the subconscious data rate. I've seen estimates that go up as high as, say, 400 gigabits per second, and others that, that go maybe as low as 20 megabits. But, you know, thousands, maybe millions of times more um, data being processed by the, your subconscious mind than by your conscious mind. And in terms of the capacity, uh, you know, there's been research that shows that we can only hold you know, four or maybe seven things in our conscious mind at a time, otherwise we forget them. Whereas the subconscious mind can hold, um, you know, billions and billions of objects. So, you know, what is that subconscious mind? Is it all up there in the gray matter? Um, you know, there are actually some, some interesting studies and some kind of extrapolations that you can do about that too. So, for example, um, the brain has a hundred trillion synapses. So if, if each synapse holds a bit, then the capacity of the brain would be a total of about 12 terabytes, okay? Um, but some people have done some research showing that in a human lifetime, the brain processes about 3 million times that much data. So, okay, well, maybe that makes sense, because maybe we throw out, you know, 99.999997 or whatever of all the data that we ever perceive, maybe we it, it just ends up fading away into something that we can never recall. However, there are people um, who have something called eidetic memory or hyperthymesia, um, autistic savants, people who have what you might call total recall, who can um, re recall, you know, exact scenes at any point in time in their lives. Um, and other people who may not have these conditions can, under hypnosis, recall exact scenes in, in great detail uh, of any day of their lives. You pick a day, and they'll tell you what, what they had for breakfast and who they were sitting with and, you know, the bird that flew by the window and stuff like that. Well, that's impossible 
because the brain can't really handle all of that. So, I mean, that's actually some good evidence that, that the brain is somewhat like a cache, and that really there's some more part of the mind that is out there beyond the human brain stored somewhere else. I mean, this is just one category of evidence of that. I could We could talk about this all night long probably, <laughs> but um, it's just one, one example. Yeah. Well, and memory is more of a recreation of events when you think about them anyway. They're not like uh, recalling a digital image as much as your brain taking bits of data and recreating it in a virtual memory. Absolutely. That's true. In fact, you know, an interesting thing is that the, the more you remember something, the more inaccurate your memory becomes. This is a little counterintuitive, but if you think about the way the brain supposedly works, um, when you remember something, it is recreating that memory as you're talking about, but your brain is working to try to recreate that, so every time it does it, it does it with a little bit less accuracy. Hmm. So um, it, it's sort of like, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, if you were irradiating a, uh, um, a disk drive or something like that, and you're just killing bits one after another, um, the more time you remember something, the more inaccuracy creeps in, which is why people, I, I mean, I've had this experience before where I, I've talked to somebody that I went to school with or something. Hey, hey remember when we, uh, you know, when we did this uh, in this uh, science class? And I said, no, no, that was math class. No, no, it was science class. You know? <laughs> uh-huh. and, and it's something that, you know, you might have thought about many, many times over the years, but the other person thought about it many times, and who knows whose memory is really <laughs> accurate at that point. Or when you see something from years ago on video that you thought happened completely differently, and you're going, huh, so that's what happened. Absolutely. I, I took a... I'll never forget a class I took at Cornell uh, with a communication professor who gave us a, a great example. He had conducted an experiment with his class where, um, this wasn't my class, but he was you know, telling us about another class, where he had somebody come in and you know brandishing a gun and started yelling at the professor because he said, you've been sleeping with my wife or something and, and you know shooting he shot the gun and the professor fell down and before the students like kind of ran out of the classroom and of course this would probably be illegal to do t- today yeah, but, yeah. you know 30 years ago people would do these kinds of things before people ran out of the classroom professor stood up and said hey you know it was all just a big act um, you know sit down and get back in your seats and he passes around a, um, a survey asking people to answer some questions and recall what it was they saw and some people thought he shot first, and some people thought, um, you know, there was no gun at all, and everybody had a completely different depiction of the events that actually occurred, so, you know, what's the lesson there? The, the lesson there is that your memory is not at all a reliable indicator of what truly happened, and is there really a reliable indicator of what truly happened? Is the newspaper artifact reliable. It, it, it also says something about perception as well, because especially in an emotional state, you're not perceiving the same way you might in a non-emotional state, for instance. Uh, yeah, true. Uh, I think the more emotion there is, the, the less likely you're going to have a good, uh, a good memory. Now, what about, uh, there are certain people over the years uh, that have been born with basically cerebral fluid instead of actual brains. Have you ever researched this? I haven't researched it. I have heard about that. And occasionally they turn out to be geniuses without an active brain. Mm. Um, um, there was yeah. one just recently where they, uh, the kid had gotten into an accident and the, the coroner came out and told the parents, you know, because the kid had died, and he said to the parents, I'm really sorry about your special son or something. And they were like, what are you talking about? And he revealed to them that he had no actual brain matter. It was all cerebral fluid. And he was apparently a genius and had graduated top of his class and everything else, and they never had a clue there was anything wrong with his brain. Yeah, I did read that. It's, it's actually another example of, you know, an argument or a piece of evidence that, consciousness is elsewhere okay um and and the virtual reality model doesn't it it's like almost a variation on the holistic 
idea of the universe, like David Bond and all them who uh, came up with the idea that the universe is actually a hologram projected from elsewhere. Yeah, no, the, the, the holographic theory is kind of an interesting one. There, there, there are a couple aspects of that. I mean, one is that um, some cosmologists argue that our universe is projected, it's a projected um, hologram on the surface of a black hole. This doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, <laughs> it, 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 I, I understand their argument from sort of an information theory standpoint, but you don't need to invoke that kind of complexity to explain these anomalies. You know, right. the, the movie The Matrix does the same thing. It explains it very well. But the idea of the hologram is, is kind of interesting. It's, it's saying that information is everywhere all at the same time. There's an ancient Indian uh, concept of the Akashic Record, which says that the same thing. It says that you know, the entire history of the world is written into some record somewhere and that it's everywhere in space all at once and we can tap into it if you know if, if we know how um, so so yeah I mean it's, not, it's actually not a new idea but it, it you know it's, it's an interesting one um, but it but it doesn't have to be the way things work it, it could be just more of a framework or a paradigm for uh, reality that, that makes make sense to people you know what I mean yeah yeah absolutely and um what about things like uh, like DMT that seem to retune the brain into something to almost like a different reality? Well, the, you know, when you're talking about that that child who had the cerebral fluid for the brain, I mean, that reminded me of this. That a lot of times people who have extrasensory perception have had a an, uh, some trauma to their brain at some point. Um, and it's almost like that trauma um, it, uh, upsets the filters that they have in place. Uh, so, in other words, what what seems to be the case, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of theory on this. And uh, Tom Campbell, who's the author of the book My Big Toe, Toe Standing for Theory of Everything, has a, has a great explanation for this. One that he um, ex experienced in various ways, which is that. Uh, our consciousness is bounded in some way, and it has to be bounded. That, that we really are part of a whole. That there's, you know, one great consciousness out there, and this is, you know, there's a lot of confluence of thought about this. A lot of shamans, a lot of, uh, you know, mystics over the years have written about the same thing. A lot of philosophers, and you know, the idea that we're all part of of one whole. You know, sounds a little odd because you think, well, why then can't I experience everything? You know, why can't I experience what you're experiencing or, or whatever? But, you know, according to Tom Campbell, is we have these boundaries this, that make us individuated in a way. So it's a, um, it's a, it's a uh, sort of a segmented consciousness. And the reason that that happens is because the overall consciousness the unbounded consciousness has figured out through uh, trial and error, through process of evolution, if you will, that this is the, the, the best way to um, conduct experiments that continue to evolve the level of consciousness. So in other words, if you just have one big consciousness, you know, running uh, a simulation or a life experiment, one single life experience all the time, it would be a very slow way to evolve, but by breaking them off into little individuated segments, you can conduct all kinds of different experiments. You can have a bunch of bacteria experiencing what it's like to live in your stomach, and you can have a bunch of humans experience, you know, different, different situations that they're living in, in different cultures, in different, uh, different countries, in different socioeconomic situations and things like this, and all of these learnings happening in parallel um, serve to increase the overall consciousness that we're all part of. So, so if you, you accept that idea, which actually makes some sense, then, then you, know, you might think, well, maybe there is a way that we can actually tap into 
another consciousness or tap into this hole or something like that, but the structure of our brain prevents us from doing that, and it, and it prevents us from doing that for a purpose, for the, for the purpose that I just mentioned. However, you get some trauma to the brain or, you know, you get into an accident or something like that, and maybe now that filter has been shut down, which is why some of these people are able to experience some, you know, unusual things and paranormal things. Edgar Casey was a perfect example of this. He, you know, started falling into these trances where he would, he could speak foreign languages that he never knew a single word of. And, you know, there was one case where he was, uh, you know, speaking uh, a dialect of Italian that could only be determined by, you know, they had to go find a, I think a grocer in the town that he was in at the time that spoke this Sicilian dialect. Um, and of course he had never been there and he had never taken any Italian or anything, but you know, so he was clearly tapping into something else, but he had a, a brain trauma when he was a child. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think DMT could be, you know, another way that you can switch off that filter or maybe retune that channel to a different reality or a different experience or a different segmented consciousness, if, if you will. And that, uh, that makes some sense to me. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Kenneth Ring uh, had done uh, one of the near-death researchers back in the 80s had also uh, written a follow-up book and did research with people who had had UFO encounters and near-death experiences and found that many of them had experienced some kind of trauma early in their life, not necessarily physical trauma. Sometimes it was uh, abuse of some kind, and he found this to be a very common aspect in all of these paranormal, if you want to call near-death experiences paranormal, uh, all these different accounts, these people had, a lot of them had this in common. Interesting. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't heard that. That is, that's kind of an interesting study. The, the one that I've learned a little more about is uh, Tim Van Lommel is a cardiologist from the Netherlands. He did 20 years of research of near-death experiences and uh, wrote a book recently about that. I highly recommend it. It's really kind of a mind-expanding uh, book. But there are some cases studies in there of people who, uh, for example, there was a woman who was, um, she was from Atlanta, had, had a, a brain aneurysm, and the only way that they could operate on her was to uh, chill her body down to a very low temperature and remove all the blood from her brain. I think they turned her upside down, and, um, you know, and during this time, of course, you know, she has zero completely flat-lined EEG no blood running through her brain, no possibility of consciousness according to traditional scientific models of brain function. And yet, during the time that they were operating on her, she had a complete lucid experience where she watched them operate, she recounted everything that was done, and she had, you know, other near-death, you know, typical near-death type experiences that were very clear and lucid. And those stayed with her after she was reanimated. So, you know, there's nothing that, that explains that in traditional science, but there's a very good explanation for it if you accept that consciousness exists outside of the brain, and there's no reason not to not to consider that. You know, again, you know, the evidence, there's stronger evidence for that than there is, you know, for the other. Now, do you, do you think that some dreams are also a matter of accessing that consciousness outside of ourselves? I mean, some are clearly just sort of unconscious dumps of things going on in your everyday world, but when you have psychic dreams or really profound dreams, do you think that's a matter of tapping into that, that greater consciousness? Yeah, I, I think so. And <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> some of the examples of that are people who have mutual lucid dreams. Hmm. Yeah. So there have been you know, people who dream together and they dream the same thing and they see each other in the dream and then they compare notes later on. Um, and you know, that, that's you know, an example of the fact that they would have to be you know, tapping into something outside of their, their own brains. But you know, if you think about the model of our reality being virtual anyway, you're, when you go into a dream state, what's the difference? You know, the difference is just that you're maybe um, a, a little less constrained by some rules than you were before, but it's still all being controlled by your, your, your consciousness somewhere else, you know, with 
a, a set of uh, a set of rules and boundaries um, that are less strict than the ones that happen during your you know your waking state. And for all we know, we could be inside of a simulation that's inside of a simulation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one, of the, one of the interesting things is is to think about. You know, we people have a tendency to think that, and, and we do this because it's you know we all have a comfort zone, right? Um, if you play a video game that is too far removed from your reality you're not going to like it because it's going to feel, um, you know, scary, right? Yeah, so so yeah. people people prefer fantasies that are at least somewhat rooted in, in reality. So you kind of think of your comfort zone as a big circle, right? And you get outside of that circle, you, you get scared and you want to retract into the circle. And everybody has maybe a bigger or smaller circle. They're, you know, they, they could all be different. But... Um, you know, it, it used to be back in the late 1800s that scientists would say, "Well, we figured everything all out. Um, we only figure we only need to, you know, figure out some constants, pi, and things like this to some, you know, higher decimal points, and then then we're pretty much all done with science." And that's a, that's a really <laughs> arrogant way to think. It's the yeah. same way that people were thinking in the Middle Ages about the Earth being the center of the universe. Well, Char Charles um, Fort always had a great a great time reciting that line and then reciting all the stuff that science doesn't know. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, we, we now think, well, okay, we still think that way. We still think that we have all the answers or, or that maybe, you know, we're, humans are, are the only ones that... Um, that might have the answers, and my goodness, you know, it, it, you know, if you believe in, in evolution at all, you know, you, you recognize that we did not have all the answers 10,000 years ago. Um, every other species that exists, we don't think has all the answers. So why would, we, why would we think we have all the answers now? Why would we think that we know what reality is? And why would we think that, you know, our world is only this physical matter reality that we seem to experience in this 3D type of world, you know, why, why would we think that there might not be, you know, a fractal of, of complexity out there so far beyond what we, what we know today? Um, you know, that's, that's what open-minded skepticism is all about, is, is thinking about those kinds of things. Well, sure. And, and there could be entire dimensions of reality that we don't even perceive of and only catch glimpses of here and there, and that may explain a lot of the paranormal stuff that people encounter. I mean, a lot of theories on UFOs say that they're coming from not outer space, but something parallel to where we are and occasionally flying in and out. Like John Keel observed them coming from most UFOs, A, disappear, they don't fly off into space, and B, they kind of come in from the ultraviolet range, from just into our visible sight and then disappear. Right, and and I, you know, I've never seen one, um, but I can't deny the fact that there are millions of people who who have, and some of the uh, reported experiences are uh, compelling. So, you know, what explains all of this? What if if you think about this virtual reality model, you know, that, that we're under some program control? That's a perfect explanation for all of these effects of uh, you know of UFOs. You could. You know, you could, for example, be uh, out in the middle of the night and see something and be with somebody else who doesn't see the same thing, or you could see something and then it gets erased from your mind, or whatever. Almost any of these kinds of um, experiences are really easy to produce in a virtual reality. Um, it's not hard to inject experiences into your consciousness if you're living in a virtual reality. And those experiences can be ones that um, are outside of your everyday norm, like ex experiencing a UFO. So, um, you know, the virtual reality model, the programmed reality model, the simulation model, whatever you want to call it, um, is a perfect explanation for all of these these kinds of anomalies. And there's nothing else that there are other things that can explain them. You know, people can say, well, there's multiple dimensions, or there's, you know, they figured out how to warp space, or this or that. And that works for one category of anomaly, but it doesn't work for another category. 
but the virtual reality model works for every single category of anomaly that's out there. And I've spent a lot of time on my blog and on my website um, talking about all of these things. And you know, for every single anomaly, I, I can give you pseudocode um, that can produce that anomaly. Nice. And I noticed your latest blog was all on uh, intuition. Um, yeah, I actually um, did another blog tonight, but yeah, the one oh, before okay. that was was about intuition, which is another area that kind of overlaps my, my professional world, and I find it to be a really interesting thing. You know, a lot of people think of intuition as this sort of, um, you know, mystical, new agey, you know, thing that, that that isn't scientific or it's not rigorous or it's not analytical or whatever, but if you think about what it is, I mean, even if you, if you even if you hold the scientific standpoint of you know that that everything that we can draw from is actually stored in our brain. Even if you believe that, the brain has so much capacity. In this, as we talked about earlier, the subconscious is working, you know, at, at such a more powerful level than the conscious mind is. That's where intuition comes from. It's drawing from all that stuff. So. All the experiences you've ever had, you know, even the ones that were sort of subconscious, the things that were happening in your periphery, you know, uh, things that your colleagues were doing that just didn't register, uh, those are all there. And you can tap into those with this powerful subconscious engine that we call intuition. You know, why is it that we just know what to do when we go to work? When you know, why do we why do we know how to spend our time? Why do we spend twenty percent of our time on this and eighty percent of our time on that? You know, why do we make those kinds of decisions? We make those decisions all the time. And it's it's all done out of intuition. We don't consciously go through some rigorous analysis to figure those things out. We make those decisions based on, you know, a very powerful, intuitive, you know, subconscious engine that we have. Um if you also take into into account the idea that maybe that subconscious engine is more out there than just in your brain, that it's everybody's experiences, it's the entire history of the universe um, and beyond, then um, yeah, then then you know you, you really have a powerful thing to to draw from. And some people have experiences that can't be explained by their own personal experiences. They have intuition, you know, premonitions about things. Oh, heck, there's a um, Cornell professor, Daryl Byrne, who uh, did research on precognition and showed that uh, scientifically precognition is a real effect. Now, is that the guy who was doing the other study and realized that people were picking up stuff before it was actually shown to them? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, It's really fascinating research, and of course, you know, the, the closed-minded skeptics have attacked it, uh, just just like they do because of, the, because of fear. Um, but his research w- looks sound to me. You know, they're double-blind experiments. They're, you know, rigorously conducted experiments. And, and, he, and he didn't believe it when it first happened. He figured it was uh, an artifact of the, the, the machinery and the, the stuff they were using to test it. Right, yeah. Um, but, but it, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things that if you do the, you know, statistics on the results, uh, the probability that it was all due to chance is something like you know one in twenty billion. So his 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 results are very very significant, and yet it's a very subtle effect. It's not like we can be precognitive about anything anytime we want. Um, we don't know why it happens when it happens or why it happens in such a subtle way, but um, but it really seems to be something real. Okay. Uh, another, another, go, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, now what about our perception of time? Because time seems to kind of change depending on what we're doing, and it, and it almost seems like the more active your brain is, the quicker time moves. Like there's almost a, a processing level to time. Yeah, I've always kind of felt like, you know, Time is definitely a, a subjective thing. Um, and Einstein had this great quote, I'll, I'll totally butcher it, but it was something like, um, you know, if you're doing something you don't like, you know, time seems to take forever, but if you, 
you know, spend an hour sitting in a room with a pretty girl, uh, time flies by really quickly, and he goes, that's relativity. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so it's all, it's all very subjective, and I've always kind of thought that maybe what time is, is sort of the, you know, the number of experiences that you're having. So if you're in a information-rich environment where things are happening all the time and you're getting stimulated like crazy, time will go by quickly because it takes, takes less clock time to have all of that information coming in to your, your senses. Whereas if you're in an environment where you're bored out of your mind because there's no stimulation, there's very few instances of stimulation, um, time feels like it's going slowly because you're actually measuring time subjectively based on the number of experiences you have. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So, yeah, so, the, so that, but, but again, all of that is, all of that is conscious. So it, it's all, you know, based on this sort of, you know, conscious engine that, that's driving everything and experiencing everything at its own rate. So time is maybe an artifact of consciousness. And uh, when, when it comes, one of the other things that, that kind of hints that consciousness is saying else is the fact that we can't just take someone who died, who's, whose body is still in good shape, and just, like, give them a jolt of electricity and bring them back. Yeah, that, that's always bothered me. It, <laughs> it, you know, this idea that, um, you know, the, the, the people, people often say, well, when somebody dies, their cells go into decline and therefore they, they you, you can't be kind of reanimated but you know I think all, all the experiments of trying to reanimate somebody like right after they die by you know pumping blood through their body you know artificial um, hearts things like that they don't work and there's no there's no real reason why that shouldn't work you know there's something special about life. There's something special about, you know, the consciousness that appears to occupy a body. And it, it, it doesn't have to do with the, you know, the, the death of cells. Uh, I've, I've actually read some cases where, you know, cells actually can stay alive for much longer in some conditions than, you know, hours at a time, that there's no reason that a cell couldn't be reanimated, um, you know, hours after death. You know, as long as the temperature is not over 80 degrees, I don't know what it was, but right, um, right. reading the study kind of shows shows that you know there's something more to it. And I kind of think that again, I, I believe in the soul. I believe that the consciousness exists outside of the brain, and it makes the decision that that's the time to leave. And and you know, the body was just a vessel, and the body can go do what it will, you know, decay according to the rules of of the program, and the consciousness will now go back to the, you know, universal consciousness and decide what to do next. Right. And, and there's also cases where people have been dead for a very long time, where they've actually been put in the morgue and then come back to life, where if the cells were decaying, that if that was the only factor, that shouldn't have been possible. Right. And, and certainly it does help that they're chilled or whatever, but yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, there, there's not a, you know, there's not a, a, a good scientific rationale behind, you know, why death is permanent. All right. And uh, what about, like, reincarnation? Does a virtual model account for things like that? Yeah, sure, it does. Uh, you know, the idea that, you know, if your consciousness does uh, stand on its own, that um, it, can, it can decide what, what it does next. You know, another segmented consciousness that it'll old experience and some of the folks who have um, actually had some you know I would say you know sort of scientific thinking behind their extrasensory experiences or their paranormal experiences or whatever have uh, you know developed some good theories around you know these ideas um, such as the idea that you're uh, consciousness doesn't have to be in one uh, segmented 
you know, body at a time. It could be actually in multiples, but it stays segmented, uh, you know, from a, from a logical standpoint so that you're not confused about the experiences that you're having. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's the virtual reality model definitely easily supports that idea of uh, reincarnation. It might not be in the Indian sense of reincarnation, but, it, you know, it seems to be the case that your consciousness can survive death and can reanimate somewhere. All right. Um, now, where can people get your book? Um, Amazon is, is the place to get it. Uh, we used to sell them on the website, but the uh, our e-commerce provider uh, just got bought up by somebody else. I'm not sure what they're doing right now. So uh, basically, we just point people to Amazon. Um, the book is there. There's a Kindle version. Uh, Kindle version is a little bit different than the hardcover version uh, in that it, I just cleaned up some of the um, typos and things like that, <laughs> uh, some grammatical mistakes that I discovered over the years. So that's you know probably a little bit of a cleaner version, but they both really have, have the same content. And you put the book out when? Um, early in 2008. And um, so they're, you know, it's still out there. And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, ship boxes of books off to Amazon every so often to support their needs. So um, (laughs) people keep buying it. And uh, and the book is called what? It's called The Universe Solved. There's a website, theuniversesolved.com, and I encourage people to go to that. We have a pretty lively forum. Uh, where people explore a lot of these ideas. Uh, my blog is there. Um, just, you know, more thoughts, more categories of evidence. There's 11 different categories of evidence that our reality might be programmed. There's a little artificial intelligence named Morpheus on the site that people can talk to. There's, you know, all kind of food for thought, fun things to, uh, to read and think about. And plus your blog. And the blog, yep. All right. Well, I thank you so much for calling in tonight and being on our debut show sh- here. Um, well, thank you, too. It was, uh, it was very exciting and, and really great to be broadcasting out into Ithaca land. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, we're going to end the show tonight with a, a song that I think is quite appropriate for tonight's show. This is Worrying World from Psyche Corporation about the mathematics of the universe. So once again, Jim, book is... The Universe Solved. People can check it out on Amazon. And uh, all the stuff we talked about tonight, kind of in the book? Yes, well, uh, pretty much. I mean, I'd say maybe half of it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Excellent. And check out his website, theuniversesolved.com. This has been uh, the debut episode of Where Did the Road Go? And this is Psyche Corporation. Thank you very much, sir. Come in. Do you read me? Do you understand the numbers pouring over your connection? To perfection. Five, eight, three. Have you heard the singing soaking into our transmission? Twenty-one, thirty-four, fifty-five, eighty-nine, one hundred and forty-four.
it's time to be wary You are getting to the heart of the universe Put your clothes and tight rehab Chambers number 1597 And counting And counting And counting